we were somewhere around Barstow on the edge of the desert when the drugs began to take hold. It's a line on par with Call Me Ishmael. Once heard, those familiar with it know exactly what someone is talking about. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas by the legendary Hunter S. Thompson. It's the story of outlawed journalist Raul Duke as he and his compatriot Dr. Gonzo attempt to cover the Mint 400, a motorcycle race in the desert. Along the way, they consume every drug in existence, copious amounts of alcohol, abuse the locals, terrorize the tourists, and lose track of all reality. However, ask most readers about the story. They don't go much deeper than recounting the comical madness of its anti-hero protagonists. Don't get me wrong. It's a surreal Bacchanalian adventure, and a fun one at that. However, there are underlying themes most don't appreciate. This goes for the film as well. Terry Gilliam's movie is excellent. Easily, in my opinion, one of the best page-to-screen adaptations ever. One can almost read along as the story unfolds in celluloid. Yet it's been my experience that many people regard fear and loathing as simply a tale of excess. The adventures of two anti-heroes casually consuming every chemical and bit of booze conceived. And while there is a case to be made for fear and loathing as the most intelligent stoner comedy ever, I think that misses a great deal of the point. It's like saying Moby Dick is about whaling. Your dart hit the board, but you're far from the bullseye. Consider first and foremost the full title, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, A Savage Journey into the Heart of the American Dream. Umberto Eco once wrote about how titles inform the reader what to think about when delving into a story. Given Hunter Thompson's background in journalism, he can be forgiven such a direct title. Though that said, one of the joys of the novel is that it hides nothing. In a way, the title is almost a warning. After writing The Kentucky Derby is Decadent and Depraved, another wonderfully unsubtle title, Thompson made it a point in his journalism to document the hideousness of people, even when that meant admitting to his own ugliness. After all, a tenant of gonzo journalism, the style Thompson created and pioneered, meant he wasn't merely observing the story, he was part of it. For those not in the know, Raoul Duke was a persona Hunter Thompson employed in his early writing in order to write more honestly about things that might hurt his career. Things like not paying massive hotel bills, sneaking cocaine into a drug enforcement convention, or threatening to harpoon an acid-crazed roommate. So, when writing about Raoul Duke's escapades, Thompson is essentially writing about his own. When he types about people in Vegas humping the American dream, beat the dealer and go home rich, he comments on it while gambling, buying into the lie, the desperate bid to win, and when it fails, another two bucks down the tube, he too has to calm down, learn to enjoy losing. Essentially, for all the iconoclast antics, Raoul Duke is no better than the dead-eyed people flushing money down the slots. Whatever satirical comical jabs he hits them with occasionally punch him in the face as well. No matter what seems to set us apart, we're all floundering in the same nightmare, grasping at a brass ring just out of reach. Las Vegas then acts as a microcosm for America and the pursuit of its mythic dream. Failure is almost to be expected, the house always wins. Yet in the casino, escapism and opportunity combine into an insane amalgamation. There is always the possibility of winning, as well as copious means to avoid the depressing burden of seemingly inevitable defeat. In many ways, Dr. Gonzo and Raoul Duke are quixotic knights, crusading to grasp the American dream, while simultaneously too disillusioned to believe it can be achieved, hence the necessity of their drug and alcohol binge. Keep in mind, Raoul Duke and by extension Hunter Thompson feels a sense of belonging to a defeated movement. The Wave Speech in Chapter 8, one of the best parts of the book, sums up the entire hippie counterculture zeitgeist as well as laments its seemingly inevitable failure. In it, Thompson recounts how you could strike sparks anywhere. There was a fantastic universal sense that whatever we were doing was right, that we were winning. And that, I think, was the handle, that sense of inevitable victory over the forces of old and evil. 
Not in any mean or military sense. We didn't need that. Our energy would simply prevail. There was no point in fighting, on our side or theirs. We had all the momentum. We were riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave. So now, less than five years later, you can go up on a steep hill in Las Vegas and look west, and with the right kind of eyes, you can almost see the high water mark, that place where the wave finally broke and rolled back. Raoul Duke is a defeated crusader who believed in a righteous cause that never amounted to anything. He saw the world given an opportunity to make itself better and do nothing with it. This is, in my opinion, the classic birth of a cynic. True cynics start out as romantics. They see the world as it could be, but constantly confronted with how the world chooses to be, they burn out. Optimism withers, evolving them, over time, into disillusioned cripples. This adds another facet to the excessive consumption of recreational drugs and alcohol, while simultaneously making that behavior an act of zero fucks given. Keep in mind the quote from Samuel Johnson at the beginning of the novel. He who makes a beast of himself gets rid of the pain of being a man. Through excessive consumption, Raoul Duke escapes his fear, his cynicism, and even his disillusionment with the failed counterculture revolution by making a mockery of its belief that drug use can improve existence, expand consciousness, and so forth. Furthermore, though their excess comes across to many as rebellious, these are two frightened people who don't feel they belong in this world. The paranoia check-in when Raoul Duke believes the room is filling with blood and he's surrounded by literal lounge lizards is often shrugged off as a consequence of his being high on acid. I would contend his paranoia is being amplified by the drug, his discomfort around people exacerbated by LSD. Consider lines such as, This was Bob Hope's turf, Frank Sinatra's, or The circus circus is what the whole hep world would be doing on Saturday night if the Nazis had won the war. Beneath the sarcasm, there's a clear impression of the kind of people in certain places. Keep in mind, a popular article about Sinatra, a celebrated profile by Gay Talese, published in 1966, documented how Sinatra could and would demand clubs eject people because he didn't care for how they dressed. The Circus Circus, a refuge that would appeal to the devotees of the Sixth Reich, None of these sound like welcoming environments for two admitted freaks from the freak kingdom, crusaders from a failed cultural revolution. And while there is something admirable about Dr. Gonzo and Duke's utter unwillingness to hide what they are, their fear of others is apparent throughout the novel. Though that fear also breeds loathing, inspiring them to be as monstrous as possible as a kind of fuck you to those judging them negatively. The point is, these aren't just two wild weirdos binging for no reason. They have complicated psychological and philosophical reasons for indulging in excess consumption. It helps relieve them of the pain they feel, grating against a world they don't belong in, while numbing a persistent sense of defeat. At the same time, however, Raoul Duke is aware, in some form or another, that's why everyone is in Las Vegas, to escape from reality. When looked at from a certain angle, Fear and Loathing becomes a very dark comedy about two cynical men on a quixotic adventure to mock the system. Yes, they're rebels, but they're also broken people carrying a heavy sadness. Yet like all comedies, it ends on an optimistic note. The closing lines of the novel read, By the time I got to the bar, my heart was full of joy. I felt like a monster reincarnation of Horatio Alger, a man on the move just sick enough to be totally confident. Now, Fear and Loathing can stand alone. It doesn't need much more than its own text to be a deep dive. However, an awareness of its background, how it came to be, adds another dimension to the story, and I feel it's especially important now, given the times we're currently living through in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder by the police. In March of 1971, Hunter Thompson and activist attorney Oscar Zeta Acosta slipped away from Los Angeles. At the time, Thompson was writing about the alleged murder of Ruben Salazar by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Salazar, 
a respected and award-winning journalist, was killed on August 29, 1970. When police turned a peaceful protest into a riot, Salazar retreated to the Silver Dollar Bar. While there, a deputy fired a 10-inch wall-piercing tear gas canister into the bar. It struck Salazar in the head, killing him. Despite the coroner ruling his death a homicide, no arrests were ever made, and many believed Salazar, an outspoken activist for Chicano rights, had been assassinated. Consider that on at least three occasions, the sheriff's department demanded Salazar, quote, tone down what they considered negative reporting. They didn't care for the way Salazar honestly reported brutality and abuses by the police, yet each time they told Salazar to tone it down, he told them to fuck off. So it's no surprise people found it suspiciously convenient the sheriff's department accidentally killed someone they openly didn't care for. In the article, Strange Rumblings in Azatlan, Thompson extensively writes about this event as well as the prevailing atmosphere in Los Angeles afterward. Even a year later, a palpable tension remained on the streets of East L.A., especially as it became increasingly clear there would be no justice for Ruben Salazar. However, trying to explore the story presented multiple hazards. Thompson wrote, after a week or so on the story, I was a ball of nerves and sleepless paranoia, figuring I might be next, and I needed some excuse to get away from the angry vortex of that story and try to make sense of it without people shaking butcher knives in my face all the time. So, he and Oscar Zeta Acosta slipped off to Las Vegas under the guise of covering the Mint 400. Their time together established the groundwork for what would become Fear and Loathing. This initial 2,500-word manuscript was aggressively rejected by Sports Illustrated, who had only asked for 250 words. But it convinced co-founder of Rolling Stone magazine, Jan Werner, to give the go-ahead for more material. As such, Thompson went back to Vegas in April to cover the National District Attorney's Association's Conference on Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Hammering out the Salazar story on a selectric typewriter, Thompson relaxed from the heavier article by composing his notes into the narrative that would become Fear and Loathing. The Vegas story helped him decompress after typing up the grim realities of Salazar's death and its aftermath. Perhaps that's why there's a light-hearted quality to certain parts of Fear and Loathing. Writing the Vegas story provided Thompson with his only, quote, loose and human moments while crafting the Salazar article. In this way, there wouldn't be a fear and loathing if not for the article Strange Rumblings in Azadlan. As I said before, fear and loathing isn't just the story of two wild weirdos on a bender. It's two quixotic knights on a last crusade. Their aim, in the words of Hunter S. Thompson, not necessarily to win, but mainly to keep from losing completely. Thank you.